God says, All hast thou spoken as my thoughts are, all as my eternal purpose hath decreed. And that's the trouble with conversations with God. He knows exactly what you're going to say before you've said it. This is Open Book, a podcast about interpreting literature with Michael Elliott. Welcome to Open Book, Episode 5, How to Read John Milton's Paradise Lost, Books 2-3. to I'm Michael Elliott, Associate Professor of English at the University of Calgary, and today's topic is the second in a series on John Milton's Paradise Lost, covering the second and third of its 12 books. If you've not heard the first episode in this series, you can go listen to it now, but in essence, it offers an overview of Milton's life and times, advice on how to read and annotate Milton's language, including his syntax or word order, my account of Paradise Lost's form and subject as the first epic poem in English on the Christian myth of creation and original sin, and finally, my account of what happens in Book 1, namely, Satan and the other rebel angels preparing to debate how to avenge themselves against God. And that's where this episode resumes the story. As ever, the source of my quotations from Paradise Lost is Gordon Teske's 2005 Norton edition. We'll go through books two and three, focusing on how to read them rather than what you'll find there. First, we'll consider how Milton, the blind poet, deals with the difficulty of describing indescribable things. Then, we'll resume the story with the debate in hell and discover how the Oxford English Dictionary can illuminate its terms. And finally, we'll eavesdrop on a conversation between God and his son to consider how God can know what will happen without causing it to happen, and how God and Milton endow characters with traits to respond to their circumstances. The settings of books two and three are the most cosmologically varied and diverse in all of Paradise Lost. Milton details the rebels' explorations of hell in book two, lines 618 through 28, before Satan arrives at the gates in lines 643 following. He travels then through the realms of chaos and night, which are disorientingly devoid of forms or of light in lines 890 through 916, and Satan then has a view of heaven and of the created universe hanging by a golden chain, in lines 1046 through 55, and that is all just in book two. In book three, we travel to heaven for a conversation between God and his son, who watch Satan's flight until he alights on the outer edge of our universe, sees the stairway to heaven in lines 501 following of book three, and then disguises himself to ask the archangel Uriel for directions to earth. So in these two books, we encounter all of Milton's cosmology, its spiritual and its physical realms. I've skipped over a great deal of material, so you can read it for yourself, like Satan's memorable encounter in Book 2, lines 629 to 870, with his daughter Sin and their incestuous son Death, who opened the gates of hell. But before you read that episode, be sure to read Sin and Death's entries in the Glossary of Names at the back of Teske's Norton edition. I've skipped all that material because, like I said in my first episode on this poem, any reading of a long text picks and chooses what to focus on depending on the reader's argument. I'll guide you to forming your own arguments, not by offering you mine, but by giving you an understanding of Milton's cosmos, his characters, and their circumstances in which you isolate patterns and features that intrigue you. First, we have to talk about the indescribability of Milton's subjects. 
At certain moments, characters in these books and in others to come encounter something so sublime and complex that words fail them, just as they fail the poet. For instance, before Raphael narrates the war in heaven in books five and six, he tells Adam that his words are inadequate to the subject only because human understanding is limited. When Satan sees the created universe for the first time, it fills him with wonder and envy. As Raphael does with Adam, Milton resorts to a simile that we can understand. It begins at line 540 of Book 3. Satan, from hence now on the lower stair that scaled by steps of gold to heaven gate, looks down with wonder at the sudden view of all this world at once, as when a scout through dark and desert ways with peril gone all night at last by break of cheerful dawn obtains the brow of some high-climbing hill, which to his eye discovers unaware the goodly prospect of some foreign land first seen, or some renowned metropolis with glistering spires and pinnacles adorned which now the rising sun gilds with his beams. Such wonder seized, though after heaven seen, the spirit malign. But much more envy seized at sight of all this world beheld so fair. The human explorer of some foreign land or renowned metropolis is a pale imitation of Satan's wonder, smaller by many orders of magnitude, and Milton is testing the limits of human perception and understanding in books two and three. In his opening to book three, he describes his imaginative descent to hell and his ascent through, quote, chaos and eternal night, in line 18, to the light of heaven. And Milton mentions light because it represents God's first creation and his enduring presence. Like Satan, Milton senses his distance from that light. It shines not for this blind poet, with, quote, these eyes that roll in vain to find thy piercing ray and find no dawn, in lines 23 to 24. It sounds like Milton is lamenting the darkness surrounding his thoughts, which he turns into the, quote, harmonious numbers of Paradise Lost's lines, but then Milton validates his inward eye, which sees what other mortals can't. Consider lines 37 through 55 of Book 3. Then feed on thoughts that voluntary move harmonious numbers as the wakeful bird sings darkling and in shadiest covert hid tunes her nocturnal note. Thus with the year seasons return, but not to me returns day or the sweet approach of even or morn or sight of vernal bloom or summer's rose, or flocks, or herds, or human face divine, but cloud instead, and ever during dark surrounds me. From the cheerful ways of men cut off, and for the book of knowledge fair, presented with a universal blank of nature's works, to me expunged and raised, and wisdom at one entrance quite shut out. So much the rather thou, celestial light, shine inward, and the mind, through all her powers, irradiate their plant eyes, all mist from thence purge and disperse, that I may see and tell of things invisible to mortal sight. By the time he began writing Paradise Lost, Milton had been blind for a decade. I said writing, but in fact it was dictating. He awoke each morning, we're told, with 15 or 20 lines of verse already composed in his head, which he dictated and then revised and expanded as his daughters read them back to him. He has this method in mind when comparing his, quote, thoughts that voluntary move harmonious numbers to the bird who t tunes her nocturnal note.
In Book 1, Satan says to Beelzebub that they should convene the other rebels to, quote, Consult how we may henceforth most offend our enemy, our own loss how repair, how overcome this dire calamity. That's in Book 1, around line 185 following. The first part of Book 2 presents the debate that addresses that question. What should the rebel angels do to, quote, claim our just inheritance of old? Satan asks in line 38 of Book 2. Satan convenes them and then poses the tactical question in the lines that follow. By what best way, whether of open war or covert guile, we now debate? They tried open war already in their rebellion in heaven until God's angelic army, led by his son, threw them over the crystal battlements to the deepest pits of hell. The other option is covert guile. So what do those words mean? There are three ways to find the meanings of unfamiliar words. The first is in footnotes in the edition that you're reading, because chances are other readers have struggled with the same words that you don't understand. Good editors anticipate that with footnotes, but they can't annotate everything. So in this case, you need another option. Option two is to infer the meaning from the context. Satan sets up the debate as a clear dichotomy, whether of open war or covert guile. So covert guile is clearly not the same as open war. And if so, then covert somehow means not open, and guile means not war. There are other contexts. You could underline the word and just move along, trusting that you'll figure it out eventually. Your third option is, of course, to use a dictionary at this stage or later on. But then that poses a new problem. Which dictionary should you use? could just search up the words online. The trouble is that they'll pull you down a rabbit hole of people saying semi-reliable things about Milton in summaries or modernizations or so-called study guides. None of those sources are bad in themselves, and in fact many can be quite useful and some are even trustworthy. If they send you back to the text with confidence, then that's just fine. But there are so many of those sources of dubious authority that you'll be tempted simply to trust the first one you find. And that is like trusting the first online diagnosis of your medical symptoms. No, you consider the source. Is it trustworthy? Is, it, is its information just good enough to draw my attention to its ads? There are some very good free sources online, including Wikipedia. But you get what you pay for. Or at good universities, you get what your library pays for. So look up covert in the Oxford English Dictionary, the most authoritative reference source on the English language, particularly on how its meanings shift through time. Your next decision is whether covert is a noun, an adjective, or a verb. Reread Milton's words. He says, open war or covert guile. The parallel structure of these two phrases helps a bit. Like open, covert is an adjective, like, say, beautiful, a word that modifies the, no the noun guile, just as open modifies war. By the way, the other main modifying part of speech is an adverb which has verb, which it modifies, right there in the name, whereas adjectives modify nouns. In this case, covert, the adjective, means literally covered and figuratively concealed. That's meaning number two. Whereas guile, the noun, means deceit or, quote, insidious cunning. And if then you're puzzled by the word insidious, 
look it up. After all, words define words define words. It goes on and on. It means, quote, pre- proceeding or operating secretly or subtly so as not to excite suspicion. And there you go. Covert guile means something like concealed deception, which is clearly the opposite of open war. So then, four rebel angels take turns advocating for different strategies. Let's go through those speeches in turn. But first, remember what I said. These episodes focus more on the how than the what of reading. So when I address a section like this in some detail, I'm showing you how one reader summarizes different parts of a text, underlining key phrases and formulations and interpreting their meaning, particularly in comparison to other parts of the text, here, other positions in the debate. The goal is not for you to substitute my reading for your understanding of a section like this debate. The goal is for you to come to your own understandings of this and of other sections. So, how do you do that for this debate? Reading it yourself is the vital first step. So, uh, and this is just for my students. If you haven't read lines 1 to 485 of book 2, pause this podcast and go do it now. Underline words that seem important and write summaries in the margins. Go on now. I'll still be here. Let's return to the four rebel angels addressing this tactical debate. First, Moloch. He's intent on storming heaven, on besieging its walls and causing, in my favorite phrase in this poem, perpetual inroads to alarm. Book 2, line 103. Moloch is a warrior whose delivery is straightforward. From the outset, he announces bluntly, My sentence is for open war. Line 51. That is, even if the rebels suffer a second defeat, which, if not victory, is yet revenge. Line 105. Moloch's two reasons arise from his sense of dignity. Firstly, quote, descent and fall to us is adverse. Line 76 through 77. And secondly, quote, what can be worse than hell? Line 85. Contrast Moloch's blunt directness with the more circuitous, indirect style of Belial, who is the next to speak. He argues for the opposite. Inaction, passivity, what the narrator calls ignoble ease and peaceful sloth. Line 227. Let's just stay in hell, advises Belial. Things could be worse, and eventually God might relent. And yet, Belial's words are both untrustworthy and dangerous. Look at lines 110 to 15. He seemed for dignity composed and high exploit, but all was false and hollow. Though his tongue dropped manna and could make the worse appear the better reason to perplex and dash maturest counsels. Remember this warning. Those who appear wise and dignified can use false words to inspire and counsel you to do stupid things. Satan will convince Eve to eat the forbidden fruit using exactly that dichotomy of seeming good but advising evil, quote, to perplex and dash maturest counsels. The third speaker, Mammon, gives a more dignified version of Belial's argument. Say that we won re-entry back into heaven and had to swear obedience with, quote, forced hallelujahs and, quote, servile offerings, he asks in line 243 and 46. Instead, he says, how wearisome eternity so spent in worship paid to whom we hate. Let us... Not then pursue 
by force impossible, by leave obtained unacceptable, though in heaven, our state of splendid vassalage, but rather seek our own good from ourselves, and from our own live to ourselves, though in this vast recess, free and to none accountable, preferring hard liberty before the easy yoke of servile pomp. It's a recurring theme in Book 2. In spite of their punishment, the rebel angels can empower themselves through self-determination, seeking our own good from ourselves. It's a noble vision of freedom, of strength. If they endure hell's torments, quote, our temper changed into their temper, lines 276 through 77. All of this inspires the rebel angels to applaud Mammon's plan. It seems the general agreement, until Beelzebub rises to offer a third way between peaceful sloth and servile pomp. He asks in lines 344 to 45, quote, What if we find some easier enterprise? There is a place, if ancient and prophetic fame in heaven ere not, another world, the happy seat of some new race called man, about this time to be created like to us, though less in power and excellence, but favored more of him who rules above. So was his will pronounced among the gods, and by an oath that shook heaven's whole circumference confirmed. Thither let us bend all our thoughts to learn what creatures there inhabit, of what mould or substance, how endued, and what their power, and where their weakness, how attempted best by force or subtlety. This world reorients the question toward this new race called man, rather than God. Do we, in line 368, seduce them to our party, or simply destroy the world with hellfire? It's a very compelling scheme, and as happens in many debates, the last to speak wins over the crowd. Notice how Milton, all through this poem, describes the effects of rhetorical persuasion both on crowds like this and on individuals like Eve. There is zero suspense in Milton's story. We all know the outcome of this debate. As we know the outcome of Satan's journey to Eden, we're not reading for the story. We're reading for the style, the details of how we got from A to B, what it was like to be there when it happened. Milton intermittently wishes the story could have a different outcome. At the opening of Book 4, for instance, in which Satan first arrives in paradise, the poet cries out for a, quote, warning voice, in order, quote, that now, while time was, our first parents had been warned the coming of their secret foe and escaped. It's not to be. We readers watch these events unfold with growing dread, knowing what comes next. In this way, we are godlike, well, or as close to God as we're going to get. God watches everything with foreknowledge of how it will unfold, but knowing the future doesn't cause the future, as he tells his son in Book 3. God created humanity like the angels. Line 99 of Book 3, he says, Sufficient to have stood, though free to fall. That freedom makes their allegiance meaningful, as God says in the next lines. And although he has foreknowledge of who will fall and when, God's prescience doesn't, quote, overrule their will, because, as he says, foreknowledge had no influence on their fault. That's lines 114 following and 118. It is a pretty fine distinction, lost on many who contemplate free will and try to reconcile it with God's foreknowledge. Many get tied up in knots of what Milton calls, quote, vain wisdom and False philosophy, book two, line 565. He's describing one pastime of the fallen angels in hell, awaiting Satan's return. They are talking, quote, of providence, foreknowledge, 
will and fate, fixed fate, free will, foreknowledge absolute, and found no end in wandering mazes lost. Lines 559 through 61 of Book 2. This is a devilish mockery of humans' theological debates, which partly motivate Milton's stated goal at the beginning of the poem to justify the ways of God to men. We have a choice of attributing the coming fall, like other events in this poem. Either it's a matter of circumstances, of opportunities and events, or it's a matter of character, of things happening because of the weakness of one and the malice of another. Seeing events as caused by character traits does away with chance events like warnings. Outcomes are inevitable because of who enacts them. The supernatural combatants for humanity's fate are Satan and the Son of God, not called Jesus Christ until much later in biblical history when he lives and dies as a man. And at two moments in the story of books two and three, Satan and then the Son volunteer themselves for these roles. They're parallel moments of suspense, or the appearance of suspense, anyway. Right after God differentiates the rebel angels from the humans, one fallen and the other about to fall, he declares in book three, lines 131 following, that man shall find grace, the other none. Because despite what I said about circumstances versus character, the truth is somewhere in between, and humans deserve divine grace, that is, benevolence and a chance for redemption. So the son elaborates on that redemption. God says, All hast thou spoken as my thoughts are, all as my eternal purpose hath decreed. And that's the trouble with conversations with God. He knows exactly what you're going to say before you've said it. It takes a pretty patient son to endure this. God's decree is right out of the Old Testament. The only way, he says, to redeem all humanity from death in line 212 following, is, quote, the rigid satisfaction, death for death. In other words, someone from heaven must become mortal. And that question then meets with awkward silence. Look at lines 217 following. He asked, but all the heavenly choir stood mute, and silence was in heaven. On man's behalf, patron or intercessor, none appeared much less that durst upon his own head draw the deadly forfeiture and ransom set. And now, without redemption, all mankind must have been lost, a judge to death and hell by doom severe, had not the Son of God, in whom the fullness dwells of love divine, his dearest mediation thus renewed. And so the Son volunteers for the mission. Attentive readers will remember a very similar moment in hell. When last we left the debate, Beelzebub mentioned a similar mission. Someone has to go on a mission to the new world on their behalf. Look at Book 2, lines 417 following. This said, he sat and expectation held his look suspense, awaiting who appeared to second or oppose or undertake the perilous attempt. But all sat mute, pondering the danger with deep thoughts, and each in other's countenance read his own dismay, astonished. None among the choice and prime of those heaven-warring champions could be found so hardy as to proffer or accept alone the dreadful voyage, till at last Satan, whom now transcendent glory raised above his fellows with monarchal pride, conscious of highest worth, unmoved, thus spake. And so Satan volunteers for the mission. Satan is an emissary for evil, as the sun is for good. These two won't meet in person in this poem, not until Milton writes Paradise Regained, the four-book sequel about Christ's temptation in the desert. But Milton makes them parallel characters in books two and three, 
by making their voluntary service circumstantially similar, as I said, but also by describing them in similar terms. I won't lay them all out here, but merit is one of them. Satan in Book 2 is, quote, by merit raised to that bad eminence over the rebels, lines 5 to 6. And the son in Book 3 is, quote, by merit more than birthright son of God, line 309. Look also at Satan's imitations of godlike authority in Book 2, lines 478 following and 510 following. A critical reader notices these parallels. First, the big ones, like the awkward silences that Satan and the Son relieve, and then the smaller ones, like the descriptive words attached to them. In other words, a critical reading is always comparative, always asking, where have I seen this before? What resemblances or differences does this moment have to other moments? Which is why your annotations are crucial. They tug on the threads of your memory. You've been listening to Open Book, a podcast about interpreting literature with Michael Elliott. The next episode is about bibliotherapy, or literary remedies for the mind and body. How reading books, particularly novels, can cure and console. Meanwhile, you can search me up in the usual places. It should turn up my blog if you spell my surname U-L-L-Y-O-T, or go straight there by typing j.mp slash U-L-L-Y-O-T. On the social networks, you can find me on Instagram, YouTube, and Twitter in descending order of regularity. And then there's old-fashioned email, U-L-L-Y-O-T at ucalgary.ca. That's U-C-A-L-G-A-R-Y dot C-A. The music from this episode is courtesy of the Open Well-Tempered Clavier Project and performed by Kimiko Ishizaka. <laughs>